Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory. I'm Gloria Copeland, and I have our good friend Billy Brim with us. We're going to be talking about 2014, what's going to happen, and what's going to happen in the future according to the Word of God and the Spirit of God. So, Billy, we're all ears. We want to know. We want to be informed right. and, and you of know, our future here. I know that, too, because, Gloria, you and I did this series on the book of Revelation. And... Uh, you know, whenever I'm out and about going to meetings and, and there you are and, oh, we watched you when you were on with Gloria and uh, when is it going to be on again? It's so good to know somebody's watching. They're there, they're watching. Good. And, uh, and uh, they've got their Bibles and they know that this is coming up, so they're all ready. There may be some good. of you who just happened to see these two women, but you'll want to stay on because everybody is interested in what's happening. In the end time. And this people, people, Gloria, even uh, in the world, they know something's up. Yeah, that's true. You can't have seen everything happen in the Middle East and what's happening right now and not know that Bible prophecy is on the, on the fast speed. Amen. It's like you driving up here today. Would you yeah. indicate that I drive fast? <laughs> we, uh, we come up here from Gloria's house. I always say at Gloria's house because, you know, she's been my friend since i know known her since the Way 60s. Back. And, friends since the 80s. That's 1900, last century, 1980s. But anyway, Gloria gets to drive up um, this um, runway. Uh, runway and there's no speed limit. There's, no. And Gloria it's, loves it's to drive our fast. runway and our pasture. Now, what kind of a car is it you've got? Uh, what were we, we were in a Mercedes today. It's pretty and, and, fast. And she, she puts the pedal to the metal. That's right. But don't you get that feeling that the pedal is to the metal? Yeah. When you're thinking of how we're in the fast lane and time is just quickening, the closer you get to eternity, remember Dr. Roy See, that Roy was Hicks? spiritual this morning that I was coming up well, so not fast. Not really, but I was glad the <laughs> Lord gave me an application of it. <laughs> and uh, that's how it is. We're, we're in the fast track. Yes, we are. And Jesus is coming soon. And 2014 is an amazing year. Amazing things are going to be happening in 2014, even signs in the heavens. And uh, I'm going to be back here in one month. And I'm going to give you homework. Oh, uh, oh yes, really? homework. Right, sure right, right. From, the, um, from when we give the offers, it's going to have homework for the next time because we're going to be looking at the eclipses oh, and the signs in the heavens that are going to be happening in 2014. And we're almost there. I mean, we're in 2014, but in April, the, the eclipse starts. So uh, right now we're going to... Is that to, the same uh, as the blood moon? Or yeah, not? that's the same as the blood moons that Boy, Brother, John, be Brother John Hagee's been talking we're about, going to wrote a that. book about. And so that's going to be next time, but we're leading up to it right now. Okay, we'll get ready. Now, now here we are in... Um, we're going to be looking at what's happening. So you can only know what's happening by, by looking at the prophets. Only the prophets tell us what is going to happen. So you can't be knowing what's going to happen by just the, reading the newspaper. You can see what did happen. But if you want to know what's going to happen. The future. The future. And as we saw in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. The mystery of The God. mystery of God is declared to his servants, the prophets. Right. The mystery means plan, mm -hmm. a secret, a divine secret. Now, this book right here, here it is written down for us. This is God's plan for earth and humanity. And if you're going to know it by the creator, then you're going to have to know this. And Amen. Genesis to Revelation, it's one book. And um, the prophets are the ones that he revealed it to. So everything, if you want to be on the safe side uh, and, and not out there with some crazy ideas, then you see what the prophets Amen. said. And uh, the, what the prophets said, uh, 2 Peter 1 talks about this. Peter's getting ready to go to heaven. And oh, I mean, that's a big deal because he was the one closest to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it sends, a, you know, it sends shockwaves through the body of Christ that he's ready to leave. And he wants them to know that he, he, they were telling the truth, Jesus is coming. Uh, and, and they did kind of get shocked because they did thought Jesus would be back way before this. He said, you know, when he went up there at the Mount of Olives, 
those two uh, heavenly beings said, this same Jesus is coming again in the same manner. Yes, that's right. And he'd been walking in and out among them for 40 days. So they expected him at any time. And so here in Second Peter, Peter's getting ready to go. If you read Second Peter, the whole thing is prophetic. We might do that sometime on this broadcast. We might look at Second Peter. But this is an important part right here. Second Peter 1 and verse 16. Peter said to them, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we didn't make up fairy tales. He really is coming again. He really is. Mm -hmm. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now he's going to talk about when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. He and James and John were there with, Pete, with the Jesus when Moses and Elijah came and talked to him about, mm -hmm. you know, what he was going to do. Mm. For he received, and he's talking about being on the Mount of Transfiguration, 2 Peter 1, 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came a voice to him from the excellent glory. And this is what the voice said. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Praise God. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. Peter, James, and John heard it. When we were with him, Jesus, in the holy mount. But look at this, 2 Peter 1, 19. We have a more sure word of prophecy. You'd think mm. a voice coming from heaven and Jesus there and Moses and Elijah and the glory of God. you think that would be more sure. No, he says the written word is more sure. Praise God. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Propheticos is what he actually says. It means the written, the prophets. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place mm. until the day dawn and the day star arise. In your hearts knowing first that no propheticos of the scripture, the Old Testament prophets, because that's all he had. Yeah. They had the Torah, they had the prophets, and they had the Psalms. They didn't have the New Testament. So he's talking about the part of the Bible that they call the prophets. In Greek, the propheticos of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the propheticos, the books of the prophecies, came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And uh, in the Amplified Version, it says, we have the prophetic word firmer still. And no prophecy is of any private or personal interpretation. For no prophecy, the propheticos, the Old Testament scriptures, did not originate because some man willed it. That's what the Amplified says. But men spoke from God who were born along, moved, and impelled by the Holy Spirit. So the mystery we're told in the book of Revelation that the plan of God is revealed to the prophets. That's the Old Testament prophets. Mm -hmm. Isaiah, Nehemiah, Daniel we're going to look at. David in the Psalms, Moses. And so uh, that's what we're going to have to get for light on what's happening in the Middle East. You're going to have to get it from the Old Testament prophets. Um, Romans 16 says, but uh, 1625, excuse me. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, the propheticos, according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. And the word here in the Greek is graphe propheticos, the writing of the prophets. It, 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 is, it is here in the Bible to tell us that it means the Old Testament prophets. Now, in Matthew, Jesus himself, and of course, he's the prophet of all prophets. In Matthew, Jesus said, you know, when they were talking about, by the way, folks, the Jews didn't kill Jesus, and really, the Romans didn't kill Jesus. They were the instruments through whom the crucifixion came, but he died for our sins. That's right. And it was your sins and mine that he carried, and it was the plan of God. Off of God's hand is hidden. It was hidden then but it had to be. And in Matthew 26, 53, Jesus said, you know, Peter had just cut off the ear 
and, and, uh, and uh, all kinds of things they were trying to do uh, to, to stop this from happening. And Jesus said, I laid down my life. But in Matthew 26, 53, he says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 mm -hmm. legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? He's talking about the scriptures of the Old Testament, Jesus. How can the scriptures be fulfilled? The scriptures have to be fulfilled. That thus it must be. In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the propheticos, the Old Testament prophets, might be fulfilled. So there's a plan of God. He revealed that plan to the prophets, primarily in the Old Testament, and one day it's going to be finished, it's going to be completed. And that's what we see in Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery or the plan of God shall be finished, completed, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. One Jewish writer I read after, Pincus Winston, in the end of days said, Without the prophets, we'd have little to tell us what God is up to and what to expect next. Hmm, that's interesting. We want to know what to expect next. And even though we are the people of the letters, the church is the people of the letters, the New Testament letters tell us who we are and what we have and where we're going. But if we want to know what's happening in the world, and remember Jesus told us, you watch the fig tree, that's the Jews, and you watch the other trees, that's the other nations of the Old Testament prophets that they talked about. So if we want to know what's going to happen and, and the times of His coming, we have to watch these things. And we can only watch them through the eyes of the prophets. That's right. So we're going to come and we're going to study, uh, we're going to begin a study of one of those prophets that particularly talks about the last days, and that's Daniel. Oh. And Daniel is tied right to the book of Revelation. They go together. Daniel had a prophecy. He was told to conceal it. Uh, John the Revelator in the book of Revelation was told to reveal it. That's so um, uh, John in the book of Revelation even revealed the meaning that was of, of this time that was first shown to us in Daniel. Now, uh, some years back, 1996, mm -hmm. uh, a present day prophet, really, Justice Duplessis. Yes, I, uh, I knew his brother David Duplessis very well. And of course, they were from South Africa and they were in a move of God. Uh, translations took place uh, back in those days. I don't know how old was he when he came here, Gloria? I would say he's in his eight, early 80s. I would think or he maybe was. Late, in his 80s. Sometime. In his 80s, yeah. right. And God sent him here. Yeah. And he sent him here actually with a message for Kenneth Copeland Ministries and Eagle Mountain Church. And so they were uh, preparing for him to come to the um, prayer. I believe it was the prayer group. I think that's right. And uh, he is from the old school. He's on time. He's never late. And he looks good, you know, dressed up. Mm -hmm. And Pastor George told me, he said, he didn't come and he didn't come and he didn't come. And then when he finally did come that morning, he was disheveled. He was visibly shaken. And he had had a vision of Jesus all through the night. Mama. And uh, much of the word was to Eagle Mountain and to uh, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. But the Lord spoke to him about the book of Daniel. And we have that right now for you to listen to. They didn't have a camera going that day, but uh, you can listen to it. And we're going to play for you right now an excerpt out of a much longer word that he gave. Thank you. First thing... He said to me, you are going to speak to the church this morning. You're speaking to the ministries on prayer. I want you to be my mouthpiece. You intended to speak on Daniel and certain excerpts from that. It is good because that is within the guidance 
of my spirit and within the center of my will. But forget your notes. You're not sermonizing. Regard it as a prophetic spirit that has come to you through me. Tell them that the secret of those four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the secret was that they frequently prayed. Although they found themselves in a strange culture. They fasted. And as they will do what I am to tell you to do, they will feel my spirit resting upon them, equipping them, empowering them to go forth and be my people in a world that is not very different from what they found themselves in. Tell them to read the book of Daniel. It is a much neglected book. Some of my people have taken from it certain parts that they liked. But I would have them as a body to read the entire book. To commence with that reading individually and corporately as soon as possible. They must hear it word for word. They must note the number of times that these people fasted and prayed. And let fasting be one of the clear motivations in their life to know my fullness and to know my plan for them. Hallelujah. Folks, I tried to sleep, but this power of God rested upon me so heavily, so mightily that I, whenever God reveals himself to me, it's quickening and energizing. I did this morning when I woke up, I was dried out. It was a remarkable experience. I'm going to read a few passages which came to me at that time to show you the importance of this book. And Pastor George, I don't know when you're going to start it. The Lord says as soon as it's possible for you to do it. Do it methodically. Do it faithfully. Both in your private capacities as a corporate body. Praise the Lord. And uh, this um, great church here at EMIC with pastors George and Terry, they um, endeavored to obey God. And in 1996, at that time, they called a Daniel fast. The people in the church um, gave up something, whatever they were led to do. I know some of them fasted television and uh, other maybe foods as well. And they called me and they asked me if I would come and we would go through the book of Daniel together. And so we did that. Um, I'm sure that was 1996. And now we're at 2014. I, I know a little more than I did then about the book of Daniel. And for one thing, we were watching it happen before our very eyes. So it's much easier to know prophecy fulfilled after it gets fulfilled yes, or absolutely. while it's getting fulfilled. That's right. So uh, when you see uh, those, um, those beasts... <laughs> that Daniel saw and you see them in the news, well, then you know. So what we're going to do here for these next two weeks is 
we're going to do, do that. We're going to methodically look at the book of Daniel for two weeks. Please uh, get your Bibles for tomorrow. Have a notebook. And um, then we're going to go through this wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, it's in two parts. The first six chapters of the book of Daniel are a chronological account of events in Daniel's life. Uh, but they, they give the beginning of something Jesus introduced to us, the times of the Gentiles. And in Luke chapter 21, that's when we see this marvelous phrase called, uh, of course, from the mouth of the greatest of all prophets, our Lord and Master. Luke chapter 21 they have asked him, you know, what is the sign of your coming? And so he gives some signs. Now this time, uh, when, when he's answering a question, he says, when will these things happen? And he had just prophesied them this destruction of the temple. And we know that it did happen 40 years later in 70 AD. The second temple was destroyed. And so he says to them, verse 20 of Luke 21, when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, that would be the Roman army. Then know the desolation thereof is nigh. And in verse 24, and they, meaning the Jewish people, shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, and Gentiles means nations, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jesus is the one who coined the phrase, the times of the Gentiles mm. in Jerusalem. Gentile possession of Jerusalem. The times of the Gentiles began with the Babylonian captivity and they shall end when Jesus comes and restores the kingdom on earth Praise to the God. Jews. And Jerusalem goes back in the hands of the Jews. So we're at the very last of it last time now. And the whole book of Daniel Ooh, hallelujah. is the very first of it. It's when the times of the Gentiles began. So to understand the ending, we're going to look at the beginning. And then we'll come over to the ending as well. That's exciting. Because this is an amazing thing. that It encompasses the times of the Gentiles. Ooh, and the hallelujah. times of the Gentiles is a prophetic period that we're right now near the close of and we'll know more about it. When we go through this wonderful book, we won't neglect it. He called it a neglected book. So that, you know, the Lord to Brother Justice Duplessy, mm -hmm. we'll not neglect it. Right. We're here at uh, 2014, January. That sounds like the... Uh, it sounds like the... I mean, the, the if future. We, somebody would have said 2014 to us when we were we young. We would have thought it was all over. Oh, my then. goodness. But uh, here we are. And um, we're looking at the book of Daniel, uh, the prophet. And he actually prophesied over right into the future that we haven't come to yet. And, and he made the book. So yes. we know that it is right on. It is right on. And we, um, we heard from Justice Duplessy yesterday. I, I know that sometime you'll be able to get these on archives or some other way. So if you missed yesterday and listening to Justice Duplessy, who came here from South Africa, had an open-eyed visitation yes. of Jesus all one night, then you can hear it in his voice when he comes the next morning to an EMIC prayer group and talks to them about Praise the importance God. of the book of Daniel. And so that's what we're going to do because Jesus talked to him about it. Yeah. So that's what we're doing right now. We're obeying the Lord and we're going to look methodically the Lord said to Justice, people see that we should look methodically at the book of Daniel. So we're going to look methodically at it. That means you read it all. Yes, amen. So um, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel are a chronological account of events in Daniel's life. Chronologically, it tells of the beginning of the Jews' diaspora from Israel. Their Babylonian dispersion was the first and the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Jesus spoke to us in Luke 21 about the times of the Gentiles. So we're going to see them begin. 
And then Daniel's going to prophesy over to their end. Then in chapter 7, we start with a chronological account of Daniel's visions. Um, so mm, before we begin uh, the divinely uh, inspired account of the history and the events in Daniel's life in uh, the first six chapters, we, we need to find out what got them there, what got the Jews to this place of dispersion, what got uh, them to the place of the beginning of the times of the D Gentiles. And so uh, we'll look at the book. This book, you know, Gloria, uh, Jerry Savelle said one time, they call us word people. They might call us favorite word people because people tend to just get them a verse out here and there. And we, that's good. We walk by it. But after you've been born again for a while, you need to know something's going on. That's and right. it's a plan. And it's God's plan. Yeah. And uh, things might look bleak right now, but the future's as bright as God can make it. So we want to look at that. And uh, here's where they were. We're going to begin with the history that brought them up. It's a divine history, remember. Not the history of everything that ever happened, but what brought them to this place. And we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 6. I trust you have your Bible there. And we're going to talk about a judgment that came to the earth and what came out of it. Uh, Genesis 6, 1 and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that were fair and they took them wives. Verse 4, and there were giants in the earth in those days. What all this means, we don't know. But somehow through this um, angelic interjection, evil angels for sure, into uh, humanity, uh, the result was... Uh, something that had to go, yeah. and it was giants, and uh, it had to do also with wickedness. I would ask you to explain that, but I know you don't I know don't either. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I could only tell you this. Now, I've read That's a lot about know. it. Yeah. I've read a lot about it, but all we know is there were giants, and then we know, we don't know what God reveals us to know. That's right. And um, there are a lot of theories and about children, it. children, giants and children. That's, that's that. right. There's Actually, children's in italics, but I think it bears that out. Yes. And so um, in verse 5, we do know that there was wickedness through the whole earth. Now, remember, God's got an enemy, yes. Satan. Yes, yes. He's and Satan's got forever. angels. Yes. Um, the ones that fell with him and the ones that follow him. That's and right. Satan is always fighting God's plan. This book is a plan. You know why? He wants to be God. He wants to be God. And he can't do it. He thinks he can, though, Gloria. Yeah, he does. That's the way pride is. Uh, and he doesn't give up. And we've got to be the same way. We don't give up. That's right. So uh, here's what happened then at that time. It brings judgment, his wickedness, and he will finally be judged out of here. Good. But uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, mm. and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Oh my. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord Jesus. said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found Thank grace God for Noah. in Thank the you, eyes of the Lord. It took one, God's grace to save person. Noah. Yes. And, and his group, his family. Yes, and his family. And that the knowledge of God is, is only down to one family. That's right. And so God judges all the other. Thank God he did, because I believe if this judgment had not come, Noah's sons would have succumbed. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And um, verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark. So God had a way of making an oh, ark. Thank you, Father. And the rains came. And uh, the same uh, rains, now he built it on dry land. Talk about faith. Yes. And the same rains. On a mountain. Yes, the same rains that, that destroyed all the life of those other wicked ones lifted the ark. And then they were saved. 
bless the Lord, and they got off that ark. And there we find um, Genesis chapter, chapter 9. When they got off that ark, uh, we're going to find out that something is interjected, a word is interjected that they haven't had before. Uh, uh, in, its, in, its, uh, in this capacity. And the word is goyim. It's a Hebrew word, goyim. And we would say in uh, English, nations. The nations are about to be formed. Now, it is written in the book of Timothy, study to sow yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I heard Brother Hagin teaching it on one time, and he said, uh, do you know why what Jesus... He said, I'm going to teach you today. He said this to a Rhema class. I'm going to teach you today on uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. He said, do you know why what Jesus said in the um, Gospels does not match what Paul said in the letters? And of course, they didn't know why. I didn't know why. I was listening to the tape. I thought Jesus and Paul should agree. And he said, the reason why is they were talking to two different groups of peoples. Mm -hmm. Jesus was talking to Jews living under their covenant. And Paul was talking to, um, to the church living under the new covenant. Yes. The law of love is the only law we have. And so he was taking case by case. Paul was and interpreting it in the light of love. So um, then Brother Hagin said when he was talking to a Rhema class that was going to all, they were dedicated to be ministers of the gospel. And so he said, you, you must know how to rightly divide the word. He said, error, all error in churches and preaching and this and that, all error comes from a wrong division of the word of God. So he said, he gave them several rules. One of the rules was always find out who's doing the talking mm -hmm. and find out who they're talking to in any scripture. And um, he said, scriptures can be addressed to groups of peoples. And there are three groups of peoples to whom a scripture can be addressed. This is so important in rightly yes, dividing yes, the word. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 32 gives us those three groups. Give no one... Now, Corinthians is a New Testament letter to the church. So writing to the church, God said, don't offend anyone, neither the Jews, Jews. nor the Gentiles, the nor the church. Now... A better way to say it is the Jews, the nations, or the church. Yeah. And um, so the Bible tells us who these peoples are. In the Old Testament, just two of them, the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Jews and the nations. In the New Testament, any Jew, any Gentile who believes that God raised Jesus from the dead and accept him as Lord comes into this mystical church. body of Christ, yeah. the mm -hmm. church. So... Um, in the Old Testament, we're only going to see the Jews and the nations. And actually, during that seven years, that last seven years on the earth, during what we call the tribulation, you'll just see the Jews and the nations. Church being in heaven. We talked yes, about all that when we were um, doing the book of Revelation. But first mention is important. And the first ones that God mentions are the nations. The first of the three people groups that are introduced to us when they were formed as nations, it happened after the flood in Genesis 10 when they got off the boat. Genesis 10, chapter 32. These are the families. Verse 32. Cha yeah, chapter 10, uh, verse 32. The whole chapter of Genesis chapter 10. See, it starts off here and it says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and they had sons. And after each one of them, God begins with Japheth in verse 2, and he gives his sons. And we can trace nations back to them. For instance, one of Japheth's sons is Yavan, and that's Greece. And so uh, then it says in verse 5, by these were the isles of the nations divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families and their nations. Then they do hum, and then they do a shem. And the last verse of the chapter says, and there are 70 nations here. We have a chart of nations that we're going to put up for you. 
Uh, there are 70 nations here. You can go through and count them yourself if you want to. These are the 70 uh, foundational nations. All the nations of today came from one of these groups of peoples. And to count 70, um, there's a special way to count it. You don't uh, count Shem, Ham, and Yafet. You don't count um, the Philistines. And uh, you're going to end up with 70 nations. Now, these 70 nations, this is the beginning of them right here. Uh, God had told them what to do when they get off out of that boat. He's got instructions for them. And that's in chapter 9, Genesis 9, chapter 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, I'm going to read that to you after the, uh, from the latest edition of the New American Bible. And it says, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So, how do you like to be told you're eight people, you're on the globe, you're the only people there are, and God tells you to fill the earth? And then he says, have sex. Yes. Because that's the only that's way. That's the only way you're you going to do it. There is a no other way, and it's going to have to be a man and a woman. It's going to have to be <laughs> Shem, Ham, and Yafet and their wives. I'm sure they were glad to comply. But they didn't comply with, they didn't get the thought, we got to move through all that the earth. They were the only ones. They didn't get that thought. Well, they got that thought, I think. And I that think can that, do this job. Yeah, but, but, but fill the earth. You know, that means you're going to have to go about in the earth. And they didn't do it. Um, in the year, um, 340 years after the flood, 340 years after the flood, the survivors had made no move to obey God and mm. move throughout all the earth. They were all concentrated together in present day Iraq. Iraq. And they decided to build a city and a tower and this is what they Isn't said. Isn't that interesting? Lest we be scattered upon the face they were of the earth. resisting. We, we don't want to do this. That's right. We want to stay right here and we want to stay together. Isn't that interesting? The thing they were told to do, they, they didn't resisted. Do. They didn't do. They didn't want to. Uh, that's pretty, um, you know. It's common. Common. Even today. Sad to say. <laughs> But uh, so we're going to go to something. We're going to go to chapter 11. It tells about their rebellion there. And uh, it says in chapter 11, verse 1, Now the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, wherever they landed on Mount Ararat, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Shinar, S-H-I-N-A-R, is Babylon. It's the same thing. It means the same thing. And they dwelt there all together. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Now, there are no natural stones in this land where they are in the plain of Shinar. Hmm. They couldn't have used stones. They had to have bricks. And they made some pretty beautiful bricks. We're going to show you some pictures later of well, the Ishtar gates. And so they said, uh, let us make bricks. They had brick for stone. That's the best they could do, you know, a stone building. Yeah. Gloria, I go to Israel, and there are these stone buildings that are there from ancient, ancient times. Herod built um, um, the tomb over uh, Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob and their wives, Machpelah. It's still standing there. I mean, just as good as ever. Isn't that so? And we built straw houses and wood houses and whatever. But those stone houses stay. So the best they could do was these bricks. Mm -hmm. And they built some pretty nice bricks. And some of those are still standing, some ruins. And they said, uh, let's make these bricks, verse 4. And they said, go to and let us build us a city and a tower whose top will reach heaven in case it rains again. We'll just get in here. Oh, well, I never had thought of that. And we'll just run up to the top. We're going to build a big tower. And whose top may reach unto heaven. And boy, this was a bad thing to say. Look what they said. Let us make us a name. That's pride. Yes, it is. Which goes before a fall. And they said, let us make us a name, 
lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. So they were resisting the will of God. They were resisting the will of God, going exactly opposite. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language, and this they begin to do, and nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So that tells us the power of confession. If they, if they imagine it, and they say it all in one tongue, together in unity, mm -hmm. then they'll get it. And it was not the will of God, but He allowed it. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was, the, it was the law. Confession brings possession. So what can He do? He'll mess up their confession. So He uh, messes up their language. Go to and let us confound their language that they may not understand one another. So the Lord scattered them abroad. Now they had a leader in this rebellion. And the leader that they had in this rebellion is a man named Nimrod. And if you'll go back over to Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And out of that went forth Assyria and Nineveh and on and on. Now I'm going to read to you from the Chumash. That's the first five books of the Bible, the stone edition um, of the Chumash. They have a note on this verse. Before Nimrod, there were neither wars nor reigning monarchs, Hmm. He subjugated the Babylonians until they crowned him. God didn't tell them to go around there crowning kings. No. He's their king. He subjugated the Babylonians until they crowned him, after which he went to Assyria and he built... He put them to work building cities. Yeah, you know. yes. And uh, he went to Assyria and built great cities. The Torah calls him a mighty hunter, which Rashi and most uh, modern commentators interpret figuratively. Nimrod ensnared men with his words and incited them to rebel against God. He hunted men's souls, mm. like Satan, his inspirer. His first conquest, which laid the basis for his subsequent empire building, was Babel. And this Babel became the center of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire, which we're going to find in the book wow. of Daniel. Mm. It was one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. With this rebellion began the Babylonian system and all things Babylon. Kenneth Copeland, in teaching about the Babylonian system, called it man's attempt to meet his own needs That's right. That's accurate. without God. Mm -mm -mm. Now, we're going to find that that Babylonian empire, which comes many centuries later, but the Babylonian empire of Nebuchadnezzar is built in the same place, and it's built on the sound, uh, foundation of the rebellion that came right there at Babel. Oh, my. And so when we get over to the book of Revelation... Yeah, that's right, man. Yeah, man. That's what, that's what meeting his own... Uh, oh. Meeting... Oh. That's, that's what I see when I watch the news. Man attempting to settle yeah. this. Man attempting yeah, to settle that. When they should get down on their knees, they should get this book right here, and they could say, God, we see this and this. That's what Daniel did. Now, now, how can we work with you? What can we do? But they're still, and they're going Man. to be doing it, mm -hmm. Gloria, all through the book of Revelation. And uh, in the book of Revelation, it's that Babylonian system uh, that becomes a part of that beast and that whole Babylonian system that's still going from there, rebellion of the nations against God, is going to be judged and taken out of this world. Praise the Lord. Wow. Glory mm -hmm. be to God. That's awesome, isn't it? It is awesome. Mm -hmm. You see, you have to study the beginnings. If you don't study the beginnings, you don't understand the end. Yeah, and you see what's happening now. And right. you know what's going to come out yes. in the end. God's going to have exactly what He said. I'm on his side. I'm on Glory God's side. God. We're going to study the book of Daniel as it applies to the whole book of Revelation, really. Mm -hmm. The whole seven years is introduced to us in the book of Daniel. And we're going to be studying the book of Daniel. And um, 
the first uh, six chapters of Daniel are history of events that happened, uh, an account chronological of what happened in his life. But now we're, we're not yet to chapter one because we're, we're talking about what got Daniel there in the Babylonian yeah. captivity, what got Israel there. So we, we talked about there's three groups of peoples, the Jews, the nations, and the church. First group introduced to us are the nations. God began mm -hmm. with 70 nations after they got off the boat. Um, Shem, Ham, and Yafet, Noah off Noah's boat. And then the nations rebelled under Nimrod. And the Babylonian system is born. Mm. Now, all the nations have rebelled against God. There is a unit. They have rebelled. But God had a plan. He always has a plan. Yes, that's right. And His He's plan, the greater He just one. didn't say, oh my goodness, Holy Spirit, I wish you'd look there. They've rebelled. He knew they would rebel. He didn't want them to rebel, but He doesn't make pokey, uh, they had Pinocchios. He doesn't make robots. Mm. He makes men with a will to serve Him. And we're going on into eternity future, and we need to have, we need to be people of will who made choices for God. Oh, thank and you, so they Jesus. all rebelled. But God has, if they will take it, He has a salvation for them. And so uh, what He did was uh, this. Not willing that the nations would perish, He separated a nation unto Himself, a holy nation, and He gave that holy nation a holy call, Praise a God. holy job. So Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, you're familiar with it. Now Jehovah said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a mm. great nation. Amen. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. And I will curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. All the nations of the earth, their blessings lie in that nation of Israel. Now, wow. God called a man who would live by faith to be the patriarch of that great nation, separated wholly unto God. He rewarded Abraham and his natural seed by promising them a land. He promised a blessing upon them. He promised that he personally would bless people that bless them. He personally would curse people that curse them. And... Uh, all the nations of the earth are blessed in Israel. Uh, just think of it. We have the Bible through them. The primary blessing is, of course, the Messiah, our Lord and Savior. Oh, wow. <laughs> but also in the millennium and in the ages to follow, earth and the sheep nations, their blessings are tied up in the blessings of Israel. Now, when God called this nation, He, he calls them the chosen people. Well, what are they chosen to do? Everybody knows they're the chosen people. Well, the chosen people are chosen for a job, and their job is to reveal God. Their job is to reveal God to all the nations. And so in Romans 9, 10, and 11, which all three chapters go together, Romans 9, 10, and 11, and they are the revelation of God to the church. They're one of the letters to the church on the mystery of Israel. And we're going to start with verse 25, Romans 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, have you ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits. It's amazing to me that all the things where God said, I don't want you ignorant, people are so ignorant. He <laughs> said, I don't want you ignorant of the spiritual gifts. They're that's so right. ignorant that's of the true. spiritual gifts. I never had thought of that. And uh, he, right. I, I guess that's his way of pointing it out. I don't want you ignorant of my plan for Israel. He said his will, whether yes. it's followed or not. I would not, brethren, have you ignorant of this mystery. He's talking in these three chapters about Israel. Lest you be wise in your own conceits. That's what happens with replacement theology. They, they're, they're conceited. They think that God only has got the church and that's it. No, he calls Israel my people. That a hardening in part hath befallen Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, this is not talking about the times of the Gentiles rule in Jerusalem. This is talking about... The, the last little goy, last little Gentile gets into the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so all Israel shall be saved, even as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer. He shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I shall take away their sins. As touching the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake for the gifts of and the calling of God yes, right. are not repented of. He mm -hmm. called them. He chose them. 
He didn't change his mind. He will not change He doesn't his mind. change his mind. Now, their job is to reveal God to those nations that rebelled. So what does he do with Israel? He plants them. He brings, he brings Abraham actually over from Iraq himself in Babylon. And he brings him over Ur of the Chaldees. And he brings them over and he puts them in the place. We're going to show you an ancient map. Of, and in, in this map that they're showing you now, Jerusalem is right in the middle of it. You th see three leaves. Uh, the top leaf to the left is Europe. The top leaf to the right is Asia. The, the southern leaf, the bottom leaf is Africa. And you see there Jerusalem right in the middle. And he placed them there. He Central said in Deuteronomy 32 that he placed them in the center of the earth for governmental purposes. And so he puts them there. And this nation whose job is to reveal God, he sets them right on that little land bridge between the three continents. Isn't that amazing? That means that, and it's the easiest way to go, the Via Maris, the way of the sea. So when the, when the caravans, trade caravans travel, when the armies travel, they go down through this little place by the sea, Israel. And there, they're supposed to see a people mm -hmm. revealing yeah. God. Now, plan A is to reveal himself through a nation by putting his blessings on that nation. So if you'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28, you're going to see how he did that. This is plan A. Deuteronomy 28. Moses, you know, wrote these first five books of the Bible. And Moses writes, of course, under the inspiration of the Lord, Deuteronomy 28, 1. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, the Lord your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on you. Hallelujah. And overtake you, if you hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the mm -hmm. field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body. That's their children. And the fruit of your ground, your crops, the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your kind, your herds, the flocks of your sheep. Every one of these blessings is something you can see. Right. Every one of these listed right here, you can see it with your eyes because the nations, they don't move spiritually. They're coming down there in their trade caravans. They're coming yeah. down with their armies and they only can see. Hey, look at these people. Look at that crop. They, they have got thousands and thousands of sheep and cattle and, and look That's at their right. children. They're all healthy and look at them. They're wealthy. Every single one of these things is mm. something you can see. Bless the Lord. And uh, let's go down to uh, verse 10. And all people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of yod heh vav -Heh, Jehovah, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord shall make you plenteous in goods, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your cattle, in the fruit of your ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto you, Hallelujah. and unto your fathers to give you. And the Lord shall open unto you his good treasure, and the heavens shall give rain unto thy land in your season. And, and look up here. You shall be the head and not the tail. You shall be above and, yes, and you right. shall not be beneath. Uh, you know, God's sacred year begins with Rosh Hashanah and it ends with the Rosh Hashanah of the next year. And uh, when we had Rosh Hashanah in September, I thought about one time when I was uh, in Israel on Rosh Hashanah and we were at a long table and the man who was, you know, presiding at the table, the dinner for Rosh Hashanah, they brought in front of him a big fish head, something like that on a plate. It was a big fish, it had a big head and its eyes were looking up, you know, like this. And it was steamed. And so he went through these blessings. And he took a little piece of that fish from the bottom that was steamed and ate it. And he said, we shall be the head and not the tail. And pass it all around the table. Is that right? So if you're a little kid and you're at Rosh Hashanah every year, and you're hearing that you're to be the head and not the tail, you believe you should be the head and not the tail. And so this was in the blessings of God. All of these were something that those nations could see. Now, I want to reveal myself through blessings upon you. 
everything they can see. Praise God. But if you don't listen to me, I'm still not taking away your call. You're still going to have the call of revealing me to the nations, but it's going to come another way. These mm. curses are going to come upon you. And then look at verse God, 64. Uh, the Lord shall scatter you among all people from one end of the earth to the other. So if you don't obey me, then I'm going to scatter you out of that land. That land is so holy, the Bible says it spits them out. A lot more was required of them than were required of all the what other nations. What verse was that? Verse 64. 64. Uh-huh. 2864. Yeah, yeah. He will cause them to be scattered throughout all the earth. And didn't that happen? And it happened. And Moses knew it was going to happen. So turn to, Mo well, Moses didn't know, but God knew. Yeah. So God yeah. spoke down through Moses. And a look at, chapter, at Deuteronomy. Go over a couple of chapters. And Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I've set before you. And you shall call them to mind among all the nations where Jehovah thy God hath driven thee. I'm reading from the American Standard. Deuteronomy 30, verse 2. But you shall return unto Jehovah your God and shall obey his voice according to all that I command you this day, thou and thy children with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And then Jehovah thy God will turn your captivity and have compassion upon you and will return and gather you mm -hmm. from all the peoples where Jehovah your God has scattered you. And if any of your outcasts be in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there will Jehovah your God gather thee. And from thence will he fetch you. And Jehovah your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Um, the Lord will circumcise your heart. Verse 7, Jehovah will put all these curses upon your enemies and upon them that hate you and persecuted you. Uh, all while they were out in the diaspora, the nations that treated them wrong, they're going to get curses. But you shall return and obey the voice of Jehovah and do his commandments, which I command you this day. And Jehovah your God will make thee plenteous in all the work of your hand, mm -hmm. in the fruit of your Thank body, you, the fruit of your cattle, and the fruit of your ground for good. For Jehovah yes. will again rejoice over thee for good as he rejoiced over your fathers." So he prophesies, that's prophecy. We learn from the prophets what's going to happen. They did get scattered all to the four corners of the world, but they're going to be gathered. And so we have what's called the scattering yeah. and the in gathering. And then when God gathers them back, they're going to be revealing God to the world because he kept his word. And he's doing that. And he's doing it right now. So that is a revelation of God. I put together a little book, just a little one you can carry around, um, called uh, God's Promises to Israel for the Land, and another one, uh, little one, God's uh, Revealed Plan that the nations who mistreat them will be judged for doing that. So I'm going to do another little book. I'm going to call it The Scattering and the Ingathering and just use those scriptures. That's good. Because that is what... That's a sign. That's a sign to us right now. I'm glad we don't live when they were being scattered. I'm glad we live when they're going to be, yes, when they amen. are being gathered. Because the blessing is in the there. The blessing is in that. Jesus is coming yep. soon. Now, when Jesus, uh, in Luke chapter 21, he's giving them the time uh, that he's going to destroy, that not he's going to destroy, but the second temple would be destroyed by the Titus and the Romans. And he told them that that would happen. In Luke 21, 20, you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. And um, then he says in verse 21, 24, they, the Jewish people, living at the time of when the Romans came in, shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So they lived in the land. They knew blessings. Um, they lived until... Um, uh, the times of David and Solomon were great blessings. Joshua took them into the land. I mean, it's like reading, reading a superhero book. Mm -hmm. And then David came and they built the temple. Uh, but then afterwards, 
uh, David's sons fought. Idolatry was introduced and they were scattered. And uh, Israel in the plan of God, David Barron writes, the Babylonian captivity with which commences or begins the times of the Gentiles will only close with the end of this age when the kingdom shall one again, once again be restored to Israel. So they're coming back and we're living in the time when the greatest miracle Hallelujah. is taking place. Now, the temple was destroyed. The first temple was built by David. Um, built by, it was, God showed David the plan for it. Solomon built it. And uh, they had this great, wonderful temple. It, it was, should have been one of the wonders of the world. And miracles happen there every day. They would offer up on the altar the sacrifices, and no matter how the wind blew, the smoke would go straight up to God. All kinds of miracles were That's taking cool. place there. That's awesome. But um, then they sinned, Satan. Now, what, what, what made this temple different? You can read about it in Second Chronicles 5. The glory of the Lord, we call it the Shekinah, the Shekinah. It was like a, like a cloud, a bright cloud, and it was over the ark, and it was in that temple, and that was God come to live in their midst. Praise but God. when they sinned, God took away the glory. He took that out. And in Ezekiel chapter, mm. in the book of Ezekiel, I, um, I was so amazed when I found this out. You know, when Ezekiel saw that wheel within a wheel, mm -hmm. and he saw that amber and all those, um, actually it was a chariot of God, and it had come for the purpose of doing something to escort, escort that glory out of the temple. Hmm. So let's read about it. I've got the, I've got the scriptures right. here. Ezekiel 1, 4. I looked and behold a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst was the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. And out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four creatures. And this was their appearance and they had the likeness of a man. Now verse 15. I beheld the living creatures, and behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a burl, and they had one likeness in their appearance, and their work was as if it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Actually, it's a chariot hmm. uh, of God, but to him it was a wheel in the middle of a wheel. You probably heard the old spiritual, Ezekiel saw a wheel way up in the middle of the air. And uh, this, this, this chariot this, uh, and, and the beings that escorted it, uh, Ezekiel 120, whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. And thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creatures, creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. Mm -hmm. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over them, for the spirit of the living uh, beings was in the wheels." Verse 26, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness and the appearance of a man above it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins upward, fire, Jesus. and from the appearance of his loins downward, fire. fire. And it had brightness round about it. Mm. Hallelujah. So this being, these living creatures, and this, this, this one who sits upon the throne who is there with them, and the departure, they have come for the Shekinah. They're going to take it back to heaven, that cloud. Praise God. Ezekiel 9, 3, And the glory of Israel was gone up from the cherub, mm -hmm. whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side, the Talmud says that there were 10 stages of the removal of the glory. And we can read about them in Ezekiel chapter 10, in verse wow. 4. Ezekiel 10, 4, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. It was behind the Holy of Holies. Then it goes up and it goes to the threshold. And the house was filled with the cloud. And then to the court. And the court was full of the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Verse 18, the glory of the Lord departed off the threshold and stood above the cherubims. And um, it went out the east gate, the end of verse 19. 
and went out from the, from the temple courtyard. Ezekiel eleven twenty three, 23, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountains, which is on the east side of the city. So the glory of the Lord goes over to the Mount of Olives. And from the Mount of Olives, then it goes up into heaven. The second temple never had the glory of the Lord like this, the Shekinah. It had Jesus when he came there. But the Shekinah glory left. And it's very interesting to understand it because um, it says in the Bible and in, the, um, in what they know about it, the Jews know about it, uh, Josiah, good King Josiah and Jeremiah hid the ark. And so people are always saying to me, do the Jews know where the ark is? Yes, they know. And it was, it's hidden in a secret chamber. Mm. And the ark of the covenant with the manna and with the, uh, with the commandments is there hidden somewhere under the temple mount. But the glory went up from the Mount of Olives. And we know that our Savior went up from the Mount of Olives. Glory to and we know that He's going to come back, back to the Mount of Olives. Hallelujah. And the glory will be once again among men. That's so awesome. there, so you see, Gloria, the temple got destroyed by the Nebuchadnezzar. It couldn't have been destroyed if the glory had been in it. No, that's right. It's just a building without it. We're looking at the book of Daniel. I do hope you were with us on Monday when you heard Justice Duplessy and how the Lord spoke to him. How important it is yeah. that we look at this book. And of course, it is tied so closely to the book of Revelation. Justice Duplessy was David Duplessy's brother. That's right. David Duplessy, Dave Mr. Pentecost. The one that is called Mr. Pentecost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was a sweet man. He, mm-hmm. he stayed here for a while and taught us. Taught us from this book of Daniel. And the Lord at that time said to him in an open vision, uh, it's a neglected book and it's a book that you need to get out now and look at every part of it. So that's what we're doing right now. We're even looking up to the what brought it, the history that brought it into being. Um, the first six books, six chapters of the book of Daniel are a chronological events in the life of Daniel and Israel. And so now we're looking at the events that brought them up to this very important time called the times of the Gentiles, the beginnings of it. So what is the background? And we've gone into a lot of it already, but uh, they had this great temple that God, you know, showed the, showed the pattern to David and then Solomon built it and it had the Shekinah glory in it. And then we studied how the glory left and it was just an empty building and uh, it had mm-hmm. been robbed of its sanctity by the sins of its people. Jesus. And um, they caused the Shekinah to be banished from the temple in the land. And uh, then the temple was destroyed. Otherwise, it never could have no, been destroyed right. with yeah. a Shekinah in it. Had to be taken away. Which and was the manifest presence of God. The manifest God. presence of God you in the earth. You could see it. You could see it. it. You could go there. There was the cloud. And so God sent then the uh, chariots of God and, and the book of Ezekiel is clear about how it escorted, the glory was escorted mm-hmm. out from the temple wow. in 10 stages and then went up from the Mount of Olives. Mm-hmm. Now at that time, historically, there are two superpowers and they're, uh, they're, they're fighting each other, of course. To the south is Egypt and to the north is Babylon, to the north of Israel. And Babylon, they had great ideas. Nebuchadnezzar had great ideas. He wanted to expand. He wanted to conquer other lands and and make his Babylonian, what came to be the Babylonian Empire, great. And so he decided to um, subject, well, he decided to go after Israel and uh, to conquer it. And then step by step, it's like they had a noose around their neck and he tightened it, tightened it. Mm. First he came down and he um, ordered them to pay taxes and to, to obey him. And they did that for a while. And then one of the Israeli kings, uh, Judean kings, Jehoiakim, uh, revolted. And then after three years, here comes Nebuchadnezzar. He puts down the revolt and um, takes away many of the vessels from the temple, the golden vessels mm-hmm. from the temple. And he also took people this time. And from those people, he took their finest youth. Uh, and among them was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are all their Hebrew names. We know because it calls them, it used the Hebrew word Yaladim. And uh, to be called Yaladim, uh, you're no older than 15. Hmm. So these boys were 15 years, no older than 15. Now, is Daniel the only one that is well known? 
Uh, they're all of known. These. They're the three Hebrew children. Oh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, okay. and Abednego. We know oh, them better we by know their them by that Babylonian name. names. Yeah. But Daniel, we always know him by his Hebrew name. Mm -hmm. But these were their Hebrew names: okay. Hanania, Mishael, and Azariah. And they were taken to Babylon to be trained in the ways of the court. Uh, the wisdom of the of Jerusalem was legendary in those days, and it still is today. Uh, with the, uh, they're a very small part of the world's population today, but they have like 33% of the Nobel Prizes. And uh, I've just been watching on uh, CBN. They've been doing a special on all the great innovations and things that have come from that little developing, well, it, it is uh, Startup Nation, it's called in a book, about all the things that are coming from there. And it has to do with the blessing of God yes, upon them. Does. And they know that they're blessed. And so uh, he captured, he came and captured their, their youth to get that knowledge into his empire. And uh, then some years after that, Bab uh, Daniel and the three Hebrew children are already over there and he comes back then and he captures the king. And eventually uh, they're gonna burn the temple and um, take away the majority of the people from uh, that are still left. And uh, the end of the temple eventually came. But now here they're going, remember, this is the first of the times of the Gentiles. God said, I'm going to, if you don't obey me, mm -hmm. I'm going to scatter you. And so this is the first of the time of the exile or the scattering. And it was into Babylon that they went. Um, but when they went, they had a prophet, Jeremiah. They've had the prophet Isaiah. They've had Jeremiah. They've had Ezekiel. And they're all telling them they need to obey God. And so when they, when they, uh, they finally sinned so much that the temple's going to be destroyed. Jeremiah told them, go on into captivity. It's God's will that you do. And uh, then he gives them this, um, this word from God, uh, Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7. So says, and I'm reading from the Art Scrolls translation, so says Hashem of hosts, or we would say Jehovah of hosts, God of Israel, to the entire exile which I have banished, God did it, from Jerusalem to Babylon, build homes and settle, plant orchards and eat their fruit, take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may beget sons and daughters. Increase there and do not diminish. Amen. Seek the peace of the city to which I have exiled you and pray for on its behalf to the Lord for through its peace you will have peace. Shelley and I went to Sydney, Australia, for, and we were there for Rosh Hashanah, uh, the beginning of the civil year, and we went to the synagogue. And uh, the rabbi invited us into his home. And I noticed during that morning service that he prayed for the Queen, Queen of England. He prayed for Prince William. And uh, so when we, got, we were having our dinner at his house, I said, I noticed that. And he said, oh yes, we always are to pray. For wherever we are exiled, we are to pray for the leaders. And he gave me this verse here. Praise so uh, this is what wherever. God told him to do. Yeah. Who That would be for us, whoever's in office. Yeah. Pray. That's right. Pray. That's Whether exactly it's right. Whether you're man or not. That's or your exactly woman. right, Gloria. Yeah. Because you right. know that the Jews have been in some places. I mean, he said praying and Nebuchadnezzar is going to be the head. So... Mm -hmm. This is the pattern for the diaspora. God never wanted them mistreated. He always wanted them to uh, be treated well. Uh, now, there were nine centuries from the Exodus to the exile when they came out of um, Egypt and, and became the nation. They actually became a nation in Israel. It was nine centuries uh, then. Nearly now, a millennium. Yes, absolutely. Now we're going to turn to... Um, to Daniel chapter 1. At last, we're studying. We're going into Daniel chapter 1. And so if you have your Bibles there, you see what got them up into this place. And we read then what happened in Daniel, cha Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and besieged it. He besieged Jerusalem. This is not when he burns the temple. This is some years before. And he puts a siege up all around it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar. Remember, that's Babylon. Mm -hmm. Into the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of gold. 
Now, uh, the tabernacle, they didn't bring. The tabernacle is still there and its vessels remained. They had been hidden previously by Josiah, king of Judah, and the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, we know this from the Talmud, uh, which quotes how it was hidden. And um, the ark and its accessories were hidden. People are always saying to me, uh, where is the ark? Do the Jews know? Yes, they know. And uh, Jeremiah and King Josiah hid it because trouble was coming. And um, they... Uh, there is also a scripture which says that Solomon prepared a place for it. Uh, I've had some, uh, a wonderful man of God uh, who's looking at the Ezekiel stones with us and he showed me where you can see in the Hebrew uh, that, that Solomon prepared more than one place for the ark. And so there was a place prepared for its hiding. Josiah and Jeremiah took it there. So they do know where the ark is. And um, when will it be? I don't know when it will be exposed, revealed, revealed, you know, or if it even ever will be, mm -hmm. but it's not in the hands of the enemies. And it's not in some of the places that people have thought it was in. And uh, there might have been it's some. It's in a safe place. It's in a safe place. And uh, so he brought some, not all the vessels, but some of them. And uh, they brought them to Shinar. And Shinar is another name for Babylon. Now, listen why it's called Shinar. This is so interesting. The Talmud says it was called Shinar because the dead of the flood were deposited there on account of the low-lying huh. terrain. Shinar is derived from words which say literally that they were shaken out. That they were shaken out. That's what Shinar means, that they shaken were shaken out. out. The dead. The, the dead. The dead of the flood. Uh, you remember the flood, the judgment of the flood that we studied? They were shaken out. Uh, remember how God speaks of shaking and judgment. There's going to come a shaking. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Yeah, that's right. Well, it right. was shaken back there. Okay, that was an example shaken, of it. And that's an example a of a shaking. A shaking, and there was that shaking. And many of the dead of the flood, uh, because of the low-lying plains of Shinar there, uh, were deposited. And uh, verse 3, um, and, they, and they carried there... Um, the king spoke unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the Yeladim of Israel. That's how come we know that there were 15 or under. And of the king's seed and of the princes. So these are the seed royal. Mm. They have come from the house. At least Daniel is from the lineage of the children of Judah. And uh, this uh, fulfills a prophecy which was given them by Isaiah the prophet that if they didn't straighten up, Isaiah 39, 7, some of your sons who shall issue from you, whom you shall beget, shall be taken away, and thus shall become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. See, Isaiah the prophet prophesied that many years before, that some of your sons are going to be carried off, and they are going to be, it's in Daniel chapter 1 here, page 2. That's where I skipped over to here. And uh, some of your sons, this is amazing to me because God, how do you know what's going to happen? The prophets tell you. And Isaiah said they're going to be carried away and they're going to become officials in the, uh, in the palace of the king of Babylon. And they did. Daniel became official. What are the odds of that? I know it. I mean, it had to be God. It had to be God it. and it was God. And that just shows you he can get anything done that he wants he can. done. I'm telling you. No matter how no far No matter how it, out, looks, it looks. How it looks to us how right impossible. now. How impossible yeah. it looks right now. Yeah. Oh, I don't know with this, what's going to happen with that God. His hand is often hidden, right. but he gets what he wants. And so in verse um, 7, it says, The chief officer, the eunuch, assigned them names. Now remember, there's Daniel, and there's the ones we call the three Hebrew children. And uh, to Daniel, he assigned Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. It was customary to change the names of people who were elevated to the royal staff. And Pharaoh, for instance, changed Joseph's name. He called him Zophos Paneach. Uh, but these names right here were given, and Daniel's himself were going to find his name. Uh, the king himself chose his name. Um, Bel is a Babylonian idol. So Daniel's name was chosen after a Babylonian idol. And the king who gave the name probably thought he was doing a great honor when he yeah. did it because he honored that idol. Uh, then um, let's look at verse 8. 
uh, Daniel 1 and verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart. Now, it's very interesting what the um, Hebrew says. It says, Daniel placed upon his heart. He placed this upon his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Hmm. Uh, Daniel is there, and you can imagine, he's a man of great faith, even though he's a boy, because he still is not going to defile himself. He's still going to eat kosher. And he knows that they offer their food to idols. So he doesn't want to eat any, and, and the meat that they offer to their idols before their idols, they haven't killed it with the kosher slaughter rules. When God gave Moses the commandment, yeah. you'll not eat blood, he gave them very specific ways, and it's all written in their Talmud and their oral law, how do you slaughter so that you don't eat blood? So Daniel knew that they hadn't slaughtered like that. So Daniel says that he's not going to eat that, and that he is not going to do it. He's not going to defile himself. And uh, so, basically, it wasn't that it was meat. It was that it was not. It was not kosher. Handed, handled. It right. was not handled correctly, correctly. according exactly. to the Lord. According to, he can't. It has to be. It has to be ritually slaughtered. Mm -hmm. They still do it today. Ritually slaughter it so that the blood is all drained out. And he knew that it had been probably offered to idols. So he can't eat it. He's not going to eat it. And uh, he says, you tell the king I'm not going. And he's refusing the king's food. That could be a slap in the face to the That's king. That's right. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this um, Melzar, he's very afraid. And he says, well, you're going to look bad. Your, your, your countenance is going to look bad. And he said, no. He said, uh, I'll be all right. He said, prove your servants, verse 12, um, 10 days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then look at us and see. It just sounds like a southern diet. Well, rice, peas, rice, peas, and beans. rice, peas and beans and vegetables, probably raw vegetables. Yeah. Cuz they couldn't even, you know, so they had to no be pork. Yeah. And so uh, or any meat that has been not ritually slaughtered. And so uh, he said, "Okay." And at the end of 10 days, he came back and looked at them, and they looked just as good as anybody else, just as fair, and they were fatter. Now, in those days, fatness mm. of flesh meant wealth and health. Yeah. And so they didn't normally, this is a miracle. They didn't they, say they were fat, it says they were fatter. Yeah, but they weren't. Bonnie, they, they probably didn't look like skeletons. They didn't look like for 10 days they had been eating what they had been eating. Because by that time, you would be, you know, yeah. you would be skinnier. But they weren't skinnier. They still retained their look of health. And um, so then uh, he said, okay. And um, in verse 17, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all mm -hmm. visions and dreams. There are two men in the Bible who had understanding in visions and dreams in the Old Testament, Daniel and Joseph. Now at the end of the days that the king said he should bring them in, three years they were going to college, the king's college, he brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Ishael, and Azariah. They mm -hmm. stood before the king. That means he, he promoted them. Uh, there are those who can stand in the presence of the king. You're in the king's court. So he promoted them to do so. And verse 20, in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in the realm. Hallelujah. And Daniel continued to Cyrus the king. We'll pick that up with the next one. But uh, he gave them a test. He gave them an oral test, and they were ten times smarter. So he promoted them uh, to stand mm. with him. And uh, I remember uh, Brother Hagen. You remember he was on the deathbed. He'd been born with a deformed heart yeah. and five blood diseases. So he became bedfast at age 15. And on that bed, he got his healing, and he went back to school. And when he had gone to school before, of course, he was sick, and he missed a lot of days, and he had a D average. But when he went back to school, high school, after he was raised up off that bed of affliction, every day he walked to school saying, because he had seen on the bed of affliction, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, oh. whosoever 
shall believe in his heart yeah. and say with his mouth. Mm -hmm. So he took John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then he took this right here, in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times smarter. Oh, he used verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and learning and wisdom. So he walked to school every day saying, and he was very, he was as tall as he was now, but he was very skinny. Said he weighed 89 pounds. 89 pounds. And he would walk to school saying, in him is life and the life is the light of men. He is enlightening me. He is enlightening my mind. He is giving me knowledge and skill. He is making me wow. 10 times smarter. He said it every single day. Isn't that And something? there came into his life a photographic uh, memory. He said, I could, I could read a page in the history book. And I remembered I could quote it to you. I never had that before. And they tested me on it. And he, of course, made straight A's. So he told of others. And that came on him. Yeah. He told of other situations. Uh, a little girl named Ollie. Yeah. Who had been I remember retarded. Ollie. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And he, he said, now, if you'll do this, if you'll use this, then God will do the same thing for you. That he'd, See, the character of God is, is revealed to us in the Word of God. And the character of God... He can do that. He'll bring you into favor. Now tell us that scripture again. Okay, he used John 1, 4. John 1, 4. And John 1, 4, speaking of Jesus, says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He knew that Jesus, the life, was enlightening him. See, knowledge is light. You have light on a subject. Darkness, you don't have any, right. any light on it. That's so he so quoted good. that Jesus was giving him light, enlightening his mind and that God was make, giving him knowledge and skill and wisdom, learning and skill and wisdom, and making him 10 times smarter. And it changed his mind, his brain, Ooh, his well. thinking. But Brother Hagin always said, that'll do work for anybody that'll work it. The That's Word awesome. works if you believe it in your heart. That's and awesome. say it with your mouth. He said it every single day. That is really And he cool. went from D to photographic. Oh, what God and can do with really, us. And he was really impaired, wasn't he? Yes, I mean, he To was. begin with. Yes. He was Glory so Glory to weak. God. Hallelujah. I'm going to do that. I'm telling you. We're looking at these things that are to come, which God tells, he tells us, that he knows the end from the beginning. Yes, he does. So at the beginning of the times of the Gentiles, he reveals what's going to happen to the end. And the Praise first God. one that he reveals it to is a wicked king, King Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. So let's take this up at Daniel chapter 2. Okay. I'm going to read a little bit here from the American Standard, and then I'll switch back to King James. In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. His spirit was agitated and his sleep was interrupted. Hmm. Uh, dreams. The word is plural. Perhaps he saw this dream more than once. You know, Pharaoh yeah. had dreams. Uh, but his dream anticipated the establishment of the kingdoms that would influence the history of mankind until the coming of the Messiah. Uh, the times of the Gentiles. God gives dreams even to world leaders. And at Prayer Mountain, when we pray for our leaders, sometimes we pray for them that God will give them dreams. Uh, as he leads us, we use Job 33, 14. God speaketh once, yea, twice, though man regardeth it not, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men and slumberings upon the bed. This is Job 33, 16 now. Then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide the pride of man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So this tells us that he often does this. And as the Lord guides us, that's, he tells us to pray for leaders, and sometimes yeah. we do that. But we do know that he gives dreams to leaders, and he gave dreams to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And in the, uh, it says, his spirit was agitated. The Hebrew says, his spirit pounded itself. Can well, you imagine your spirit 
pounding itself. I mean, he is frightened. He was agitated. He was frightened. He's scared. He is scared and disquieted. He is flat scared. Yes. Man. So then he, he's got to find out. So then the king had the necromancers, um, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldees called to tell the king his dreams. The necromancers are those who inquire of the dead. It's a brand of witchcraft. Uh, Chaldean is Latin and Greek for Kasdim, and it's the name of a particular nation which had become a part of the great uh, Babylonian Empire, and they were particularly noted for practicing astrology. Nebuchadnezzar himself was a Chaldean. Uh, and they did greatly further the sciences of astronomy and astrology. Uh, astrology, you know, that's the kind of a um, dark side of it. But then astronomy is the study of the stars and, yeah. and these things. So they, that was their particular thing that they did. And um, the Babylonians, for instance, you know why we have 60 seconds in an hour? And six, no. uh, 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour? It's because of the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. They decided to divide time that way, and um, they did things on a base 60 system. So they're very, very, very uh, adept in these things, even though they're off and of an evil, demonic uh, way in astrology. Hmm. Uh, they did know some, some things in astronomy. Uh, verse 3, the king said to them, I've dreamed a dream. He called all these his counsel. And my spirit is agitated to know the dream. Um, the king spoke to them in Aramaic. It tells us that. And the king spoke, verse 4, to the Chaldeans in, in Syriac, it says in, in, in King James, but it's Aramaic. Now, uh, Aramaic and Hebrew are very closely related. If you saw the Passion, uh, they had Jesus speaking in Aramaic. They use the same alphabet. Uh, and Aramaic is the only language oh, other, other than Hebrew that is retained in the original form in, in the scripture. And much of the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic. Uh, during the Babylonian captivity, it's what the people are going to speak while they're over there on the streets. They're still going to study in Hebrew. But uh, he spoke to them in Aramaic, which was the language that they used there. And um, he tells to all of his um, counsel, you, you tell me the dream. And you tell me what it means. And they said, King, nobody can do that. And he said, well, if you don't, I'm going to chop you to pieces. That would give you some incentive. Uh, yes, and I'm going to put you on a dung hill. And um, so then, of course, um, Ariak, who's the head of the, the chief eunuch, he tells to Daniel, evidently Daniel and the three Hebrew children were not in that group that he called in. He tells Daniel what happened. And so uh, Daniel says, then in verse 18, Oh, we'll start with verse 17, 2, 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, uh, that Daniel and his fellows would not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in the night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God yes, forever. Hallelujah. He has an outburst of praise. And, and ever for wisdom and might are His. He changes the times and seasons. Now, later on when we read about the Antichrist, we're going to find that He wants to change times and seasons. Is that He right? really wants to do what God does. But God is the one that changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Mm -hmm. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Thank you, Lord. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with Praise him. Praise God. Hallelujah. There are some things out there right now, folks, that he's revealing. And we're studying the prophets the and relying upon him to reveal to us these things. Praise and so God. Daniel then says, I thank you and praise you. You have made known to me what we desired of you. You answered our prayers. And so then he goes in um, to Arioch uh, and he tells him that uh, I want to go before the king. Verse 25, Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said unto him, I found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. I have found a man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People are going to be looking these days. 
Right. They're going to be looking for someone who can interpret to them what's happening. And really, that's what we're doing right now on yes, this because right. we're looking at the book, which tells us what's happening. And he tells to the king, that group around you, uh, really demonically inspired, uh, they can't do this. No one can do this but God. That's right. No one knows the meaning of this God. God gave it. They can't tell you. But, he said, verse 28, Oh, do you love this verse? Mm -hmm. There's a God in heaven mm -hmm. that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the Thank end you, of days. We say latter days. Mm -hmm. but And the king would have understood this. When Moses came down from the mountain, and we're going to show you this a chart of the days, God showed to him that Adam was given a six-day work week, a day being a thousand years, a thousand years being a day, and that at the end of that six-day work week, he should have done something with the earth. Yes. But, of course, he turned it over, his lease, he turned it over to Satan. And then there's going to be the seventh day, the millennium. So we have the chart up there for you to see. Now, these days were divided into three groups. The first days were the days of chaos, the first 2,000 years. Then came the Torah, the days of Torah, 2,000 years. At the end of four days, 4,000 years, the Messiah was to come. Now, the Jews think he did not come. The Christians believe that he did come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the 2,000 years of the Messiah is the 2,000 years of the church age. Now, at the end of days, and those last, um, last 2,000 year group is the, the whole thing is the latter days, the end of the days. The last 2,000 years. The last 2,000 years, but we're at the very end of that now. Yes. So we're at the end of the end of days. So God mm -hmm. is showing to King Babel, ne of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, what's going to happen here at the end. Way we back from the beginning. We are at the end. We are at the end. Of Getting ready to go days. into the seventh day. And so God has revealed That's to this king. That's so exciting. Isn't that exciting? Yep. And he says to him, God. Now, where are you? Tell yeah, us verse 28. You. I'm at verse 28. Okay. He has revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the end wow. of days. Bless the Lord. And he says, I'm going to interpret it to you, king. And then he starts, and I'm going to ask them to show you that. Bless the Lord. O king, verse 31, mm -hmm. you were watching and behold a huge image. This image was immense and whose brightness was excessive stood facing you and its form was fearsome. Now mm -hmm. this, this is going to be a metallic image, but the whole thing is brilliant. Verse 34. Well, I'll read a verse 30. Two. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of, and the Hebrew says, or the Aramaic, this says, copper. His thighs were of copper, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. You saw until a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. When this, now here it starts here with the head, the golden head and the toes down there, part iron, part of clay, that's the extremity from the head. That's the last of, of the times of the Gentiles. And when this stone comes and hits them, crushes the whole thing, hmm. uh, there's still parts of all of that in the image. But you saw until this stone cut up without hands, broke them to pieces. Verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, it says they became like the chaff from the summer threshing floor. Uh, Matthew 24, 32, Jesus said, 
Watch the fig tree. Learn her parable. When her branch is tender and puts forth its leaves, the fig tree is Israel. You know that summer is nigh. So when Israel comes back into the prophetic place, this summer judgment is nigh. Summer's the time the crops and the harvest came in and they judged them. Uh, they actually would, uh, you know, take it and they would thresh the wheat and then they would toss it up and Judge. the wind would blow away the chaff. That's the judgment. Uh, Luke 21 says, watch the fig tree and all the trees, Israel and all the nations of prophecy, when they now shoot forth into the prophetic place, see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh. So we see Israel come home. We see the other yeah. nations coming into their places. We see Russia. We see Persia. We see Syria. We see all those nations, prophetic nations, coming into their prophetic Glory place. To God. So we, we know that summer is nigh. And summer is the time of the wheat har harvest. And um, the amazing thing, um, there's no place in the kingdom that Jesus is going to put upon the earth the visible kingdom, the kingdom of the Messiah with David, the under ruler. Uh, there's no place for any of the vestiges of all of those kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, all of that's going to go away. No place for it. Mm -hmm. um, now, these four kingdoms, uh, Ramban, who is a, a Jewish sage, yeah. great rabbi said, the four kingdoms are not meant to embrace all mankind's history, but are to include and outline form the history of the Jewish exile. In other words, when the Gentiles have Jerusalem and not the Jews. Therefore, only the kingdoms considered responsible for the exile are mentioned. Other kingdoms, no matter how great, are not named. It has to do with Israel. Mama. Babylon, responsible for the first exile. Persia, successor. Greece for the same reason, and Rome for the exile at the destruction of the second temple. They so were the those ones that nations destroyed. Are not mentioned. Only those empires are mentioned. Only these. Are uh, only the ones that had to do with the Jews going into exile and with Jerusalem being trodden down of the Gentiles. The Mayan kingdom, the Mayan empire, any empires anywhere else, nothing to do because this book of Daniel and that vision had to do with the Jews, had to do with Israel, and had to do with the time of the uh, exile. Wow. Uh, in those days, now of course revived Roman Empire is down in the toes. In the days of these kingdoms, down way down at the extremity, way down at the revived Roman Empire, which I believe to be the European Union, way down at the bottom there, then a stone cut out without hands is going to strike these. Verse 44, in the days of these kingdoms, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never be harmed, nor will its sovereignty be left to another people. It will crumble and consume all these nations, and it will stand forever. So Jesus is going to set up a kingdom, the kingdom of God on the earth that will be ruled by the Messiah. Praise God. Uh, verse uh, 48. Well, I think we'll read 45 too. For as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain and the interpretation certain. is sure. This is Lord how it is. God. Awesome. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshiped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing that you could reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel asked that he would do the same for the three Hebrew children, and they did. Praise God. Now, we're going to look here at, at Zechariah 39.1 because I want you to see something. We've talked about the astrology and the astronomy that the Chaldeans uh, majored in. In Jeremiah 39.1, that's on page 4. 
Okay. This is when Jerusalem was taken. It came to pass when Jerusalem was taken in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. Now those that were with him, it names who was there. The princes of the king of Babylon came and sat in the middle, verse 3, to wit, and it names them Nergal, Shirazer, Samgar Nebo. And then it comes down to Nergal, Sharatzer, Reb, Mag. Reb means head, and Mag means of the Magi. One of the princes that came with Nebuchadnezzar to besiege Jerusalem had the office of the Reb Mag. Hmm. He was the chief of the Magi. We see that again in Jeremiah 39, 13. It mentions him again and calls him the Rab Mag, or the chief of the Magi. It's a title, chief or head of the wise men, the Magi. Daniel was given that title. Daniel became the chief of all the wise men, or the Rab Mag. Well, That's why that. the Magi knew there would be a star connected with the coming of the King Messiah. Numbers 24, 17 says, it's a prophecy. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not nigh. There shall come forth a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite through the corners of Moab and break down all the sons of tumult. Daniel knew this prophecy, that there was coming a star and a scepter, a king, and a star had to do with the announcing of it. He would have taught that during all the years that he was the Rab Mag, that he was the head of the Magi yep. of the great Babylonian Empire, he would have taught, we're going to have a king. We're not going to be here in Babylon forever. There's a king coming, and a Glory star is to connected God. to it. Hallelujah. So those wise men that came out, remember, Babylonian Empire was huge. We have a map of it. Probably they'll put that up. Huge. And he was the head over all that they honored so much that had to do with astronomy. And he taught them, there's one coming. Praise so they were watching for it. And when they saw it, whatever form it was, supernatural or whatever, they left and they followed that star and they came to Bethlehem at just the right time. Praise God. Right on time. Right on time because Daniel knew. Praise the Lord. Now that's just how cut and dry our future is. That's right. It's going to be one way, and that's the only way. That's it's the only way be. it's going to be. What's that's written? Right. Glory to God. If now you want to know it, you got to go to the prophets. Wow. Isn't that exciting? Woo. We'll be right back. There's nothing hard about faith. Faith is really easy. It's just simply believing what God's already said instead of what somebody else said. Fear believes what somebody else said. Faith believes what God's already said. Come to a Kenneth Copeland Ministries event. The 2014 Branson Victory Campaign, February 27th to March 1st with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland at Faith Life Church in Branson, Missouri. The 2014 Southwest Believers Convention, June 30th through July 5th with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland and their special guests in Fort Worth, Texas. The 2014 Washington, D.C. Victory Campaign, November 13th through 15th with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland at the Hilton Memorial Chapel in Woodbridge, Virginia. Therefore, do not worry and be anxious. The whole Bible preaches against worry because it produces stress, strain, and death. It is one of those things that the world God directly commands us not to do. So what are you supposed to do then with all those concerns you have about your problems? In 1 Peter 5, 7, the Lord said you should cast them all upon Him, all of them. You have to replace all those worries with the world. You can't do it. The greater one lives within you. You will never have to worry again. The mystery of God is declared to His servants, the prophets. 
Bible prophecy is being fulfilled all around us. The world is guessing how it's all going to turn out, but God knows what the future holds. Discover God's unfolding plan for you and your family in the End Times Package, your spiritual preparation kit. Live in hope and without fear as you study the book of Daniel with Billy Brim's complete syllabus. Chapter by chapter, you'll learn what the prophets revealed about the days we live in. It's never been more important to be led by the Holy Spirit. Kenneth Hagin's book, How You Can Be Led by the Spirit of God, is an excellent resource to help you tune in to God's voice. Recognize the importance of God's calendar with David Barron's book, Types, Psalms, and Prophecies. Be expectant, get ready, and live in the hope of Jesus' soon return. Be sure about your future. Order the End Times package today at a special savings for only $36.99. You'll receive the books and syllabus from authors David Barron, Billy Brim, and Kenneth E. Hagan. These end time resources will bring clarity to help you recognize God's mercy and goodness given throughout all time. Order on kcm.org slash TV special or call 800-600-7395 for an additional 10% off order online. We believe Jesus is coming soon. Yes, we do. But if it's not today or tomorrow or very soon, we'll be going soon. We will. And you'll be going soon. And you want to go to the right place when that time comes. And the way you do that is to receive Jesus as the Lord of your life. Be born over again. That means all your sins are gone forever. Praise His name. The books are clean. Thank Isn't that awesome? Lord. Oh, hallelujah. People can live. You know, I've known people that were serial killers. You have. You've been to prison, haven't you? I haven't? have and visited with them. And, mm -hmm. and uh, they, multiple murders. But now... They're born again, and they're sweet, kind mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to go up. They're not going to go down. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what you've done. If you'll, be, if you'll receive Jesus as the Lord of your life, your sins will be washed away and gone forever. So just pray this right now with your whole heart. Say, Jesus. Jesus. I receive you. I receive you. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Take my life. Take my life. And do something with it, Lord. Do something with it, Lord. I give it to you. I give it to you. Glory to God. I receive. I receive. I'm born again. I'm born again. Say, fill me with your spirit, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit, the Jesus. Holy Spirit, come into me. Holy Spirit, come into me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer with your heart, you're born again. Heaven will be your home. You Amen. could go today and you'd go straight to heaven. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a 10 years from now, which I don't think it will be, but if it is, you'll be ready and you stay ready. You get in a good church. You get in the Bible. You keep watching the broadcast and grow. We have a salvation package we want to send you. Uh, a book that's called He Did It All For You. Two brochures on how to read your Bible, how to study your Bible. This will help you get started in your new life. Find you a church that preaches the Word of God and preaches faith to you and what the Bible says. And get in it and grow. Hallelujah. This book we want to send you will help you grow and understand what belongs to you. Billy and I will see you again tomorrow. And you request now your free salvation package on kcm.org or you call or however you want to contact us. And we'll send you some good things absolutely free that you can grow on. And then you get busy and find you a church. Get in it. One that preaches the Word of God to you. Billy and I rejoice with you. We're so excited about those of you that have come to the Lord today. That makes it all worthwhile. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So share your testimony. Get in a good church. Be sure and let us know what happened to you. Partnerships is, is key. We're a partner with the ministry. Um, and it's a big deal, if, I think, both ways. You know, We're helping support his ministry and helping him do what he needs to do. But and he's there for us. So to me, we can just do so much more together than we could do apart. So, that's all. Yeah, and there have been times that we really needed it, and a call comes in from the prayers, and yeah. it just seems to work out like that.
What do you mean it doesn't matter? All the signs are there. This world is heading for it. Final act. Man, if you knew what you were looking at. The world's economic system is failing. The government can't even legislate a garbage route. And gluten? Evil. Evil gluten. The signs were all there. Whoa, whoa, you got a lot going on there. Listen, I'm not just talking. Revelation spells it out clearly. The blood moons, the wars, the earthquakes, these are all signs of the end times. If you ask me, we gotta take our cue and get ready. But the Bible wasn't written to scare us. It was written to give us hope. And I can see maybe if you read it out of context. Wait, out of context? No, 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 no. Listen, I read my Bible every single day. I know what I'm talking about. But do you know about the three different groups that the Bible is speaking wait, wait, to? Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. What three groups? Well, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. So if you're reading something that was written for the Gentiles, but you're part of the church, then... It's like reading a letter that's not even addressed to you, dude. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, that's when you become part of the church. So when you read the Word, it's the promises to the church that are meant for you. And that's where you find out what God says about you, what He has for you, and what He wants to do through you. So all of these signs are not billboards of doom for the believer. It's more like God's time clock, letting us know when Jesus is coming back. And it's letting us know it's time for us to get busy bringing people into the kingdom and not to get all freaked out about world news or stockpiling out of fear. And anyone who believes in Jesus is part of the kingdom. And then it's our job to show and tell people how awesome he is and how much he loves them. Okay, so, so what you're saying is, if I'm a believer and you know what the word says about you, then all the signs and warnings are showing me God's plan of protection over my life and that he's not out to get me? Exactly. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? You got me all worked up. <laughs> Dude, if you know what you was reading when you picked up the Bible, then we wouldn't even be having this conversation. The Lord revealed something to Billy about the offering today, and I'm going to have her share it with you. It's good word. And then we're going to pray over your offering. You know, I didn't want to do the offering because I've been talking, talking. And I thought, Gloria should do the offering. And she was just sitting there and normally something will just come up into Gloria's spirit, but it didn't. And I'm sitting over here and it's coming up. I thought, well, I guess I better do it then. Yes, she must obey. So what it was, was that the, the Magi, the three Magi, when they came to Jesus, they brought very valuable gifts mm -hmm. to the king. Gold and frankincense They bought and gold, myrrh. frankincense, and myrrh. And uh, the sale of these, and I'm sure they did sell them, allowed Joseph and Mary to take the babe and go to Egypt, finance the trip. Well, finance the so trip. That, uh, hey. So that uh, Herod could not kill him because Herod was trying to kill him. And uh, then I was thinking about today, uh, the Lord has things Yes. that need to be done. At any time, there are things that need to be done. And he uses men to do them. And the men that he uses to do them, they, it takes finances. Mm -hmm. uh, I know um, on television, for instance, I heard Ken say one time, they wrote the book on costs. Oh, no doubt, yes. <laughs> and uh, it, it costs a lot uh, to get what you put out every day, faithfully put out costs a lot to do. For a lot of years. For a lot of and years. God provides. And but but they they still still you, the Bible says in Hebrews, here men receive mm -hmm. the tithes and offerings, but there he receives them. So when you give, when I give, we're still giving to him. That's right. And it's still for his work. But here men receive it, like Joseph and Mary and Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that they can do what needs to be done. They needed to go. You need to get these broadcasts yes, out. Yes, yes. And of course, there's blessing for you. Amen. And of course, you reap. But you know, sometimes we just give because there's a lot to do. That's right. And we know. We do what we're told to do mm -hmm. too. Or sometimes we sow because we want to, mm -hmm. we want to increase. Mm -hmm. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over the offering of every person. I thank you, Lord. We receive that gift that's offered up to you in your name, and we speak blessings of increase over every person that sows into the offering. And over those that would sow 
if they had it, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we thank you for Bring your generosity and your blessing. And we speak increase. I command you to be blessed as you sow. Thank you, Lord Take Jesus. the increase. Say, I increase mm -hmm. in Jesus' in name. In Jesus' Your name. spirit of poverty, I bind you off the church of God. You don't talk to us. You have no control over us. And in Jesus' name, you loose the people that you have burdened with lack. Lack is not of God. Lack is of the devil. It's part of the curse, the blessings of God. And in Jesus' name, we take the blessing into our lives as we sow our seed, as you, as you sow in church, as you give to individuals, as you help the poor. Pray over it. Believe God for increase. Billy and I will be back next week. She'll be continuing to teach us on the book of Daniel. Don't miss it. Until then, this is Gloria Copeland and Billy Brim reminding you that Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Lord. Thank you for joining us today on the Believer's Voice of Victory. To purchase this week's broadcasts on DVD or MP3 on CD, go to our website or call us today. Remember this week's product offer. These ministry tools are designed to help you live a happy and successful life in Christ. Get the Word working in your life and experience all God has for you. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, be sure to request your free salvation package. This will help you understand who you are in Christ and how to start living in victory.